Thank you, Betsy, for those kind words, and David for the opportunity to address the class of 2019 while the cement is still wet, so to speak. <laughs> Any Golden State Warrior fans out there? Let's hear it. Come on, let's hear it. 2015 NBA champions. Do you happen to know when the last time was they did that? 1975, 40 years ago. You know what else happened that year? I started my undergraduate education. <laughs> How crazy is that? Is that a sign or what? <laughs> now back then the heroes were Rick Barry and Jamal Wilkes. You'd never even heard of them, I'm sure. Not Stephon Curry or Clay Thompson. And back then I was checking into the number three college, a la Forbes' recent ranking. <laughs> Not the number one like you are, so well done, my friends. <laughs> I was a first generation college student. My parents' relationship began at Hoover High in Glendale, California, and that's where their formal education ended. So there wasn't much talk about college at home, and for that matter, there wasn't much counseling at my public high school. The one teacher who pushed anything other than the local JC or the nearest branch of the state school had me pegged for West Point. But that was 1974, not a propitious year for military recruitment of any kind. One day after practice, a Harvard alum, intent on improving his alma mater's football team, approached me and got me thinking about playing for the Crimson. That's their team. It was from him that I first learned those magic words, financial aid. Those magic words that could turn the most expensive college into the least expensive college under the right circumstances. That conversation was the first step on a path that led me not to Harvard, but to Stanford, which not only picked up the tab for my entire education, but also invited me to come as a student, not a student athlete. Put differently, while I may have had Ivy League football skills, I certainly did not have Pac-12, oops, Pac-8 football skills. <laughs> In my life, there has been no greater watershed then Thursday, April 3rd, 1975, when that fat envelope came and my football career ended. <laughs> my original intention was to become an engineer. I mean, what else, right? I was good at math. In fact, I got up and went to a 7 a.m. course every day my senior year at the local JC to take the calculus they didn't have in my high school. Moreover, my older sister, my only sister, married somebody who was an engineer, Silicon Valley engineer. He even gave me a book, Engineering as a Career. <laughs> and then my father, who died when I was 16, a locky trained draftsman who became essentially a self-made engineer. What better way to honor his memory than to become an engineer myself? In short, it was a fait accompli, which if you took French, you know means done deal. At least, at least, until I started registering for classes. Now it turns out that all that college math I took before getting to Stanford opened a door for me, but not the door I had imagined. What it did was it put me in the fifth quarter of a five quarter first year calculus sequence, right? So I actually had a choice. I could either plow ahead in higher realms of mathematics, or I could take advantage of that unanticipated breathing room, open the catalog, and pick something completely different. That's when I realized how narrow my academic exposure had been up to that point. True, my high school offered plenty of courses in math and science. There was a reasonable range in literature and foreign language. There was some social studies, whatever that was, a little art, music, theater, and an auto shop. <laughs> but one look at that fat Stanford catalog, and my jaw dropped. I was like Dorothy when she opened the front door of her house in Oz, or I was like, it was like the first time I entered Baskin Robbins. It was, it, was, it was like that. Of course, all the familiar subjects were there, except maybe Auto Shop, but, but there was so much more. And to be precise, and I consulted the 1975 catalog, I didn't remember this. And alphabetically, there was African Studies, Anthropology, Art History, Asian Studies, Economics, Classics, Communications, Computer Science, History, International Relations, Latin American Studies, Linguistics, Modern Thought, Philosophy, Political Science, Psychology, Religious Studies, Russian Studies, Social Thought, Institutions, Sociology, and t Statistics. Always a hard word for me to say. What did I choose? A Religious Studies course called Varieties of Religious Thought. And as you've probably already guessed, that that course changed my life. 
Part of it was the professor, Lee Yearly. He had one of those bushy, prematurely graying beards. And so I, in my naivete, imagined that he looked like what God looked like. And I'm talking about <laughs> Now that I know better, we're talking God the Father, the tough one, the serious one, not God the Son. <laughs> Even more arresting was his field. Classical Chinese religion, what was that? Taoism, Confucianism? Did I know what Taoism even was? No, never heard of the word before, up to that point in time. Confucianism, well, we had those Confucius say jokes when I was growing up, but those were, were pretty bad, and they really didn't get me to the heart of Confucianism, I have to say. <laughs> but by the end of that class, I'd begun to appreciate the foundational and transformative power of ritual with that wonderful image of the pole star, how it sits still in the heavens while all the other stars move around it, as if somehow unmoved, it's still responsible for the choreography of the universe. That was heady stuff. And by the end of that course, I was captivated by the idea that I could dream of being a butterfly and then wake up wondering if my life was anything more than a butterfly's dream. Wow, that's what I call love at first sight. Religious <laughs> studies. Religious studies, a discipline to which I simply had no access in high school, had captured my heart. And true, my interests have drifted. They're no longer with the Taoists and, and Confucians of ancient China. They're more with Christians, Muslims, and Jews in the medieval Mediterranean. But my 40-year passion for the study of religion will always be rooted in that one potluck decision that I made when I decided to take a little break from math. So that's one course that changed my life, one down to one to go. The second course bearing this distinction was not one that I chose. It was a writing-intensive freshman seminar foisted on me, much the way that ID1 is being foisted on me. <laughs> FS12A, the present and the past, problems in Western society and culture. Under this daunting rubric, the aptly named Professor Stern <laughs> proposed to teach 15 freshmen how to write and to do so while having them engage with really big problems in the really distant past. Earlier this month, I came across the syllabus from that two-quarter course, one of those mimeographed monsters yellowed with age and held together by a rusty staple. Reading it, I tried in vain to resurrect how my mind first responded to it, a mind full of math and football, but largely bereft of other forms of thought. Looking back 40 years later, Stern's approach to the subject seems so dated. The very title, Western Society and Culture, is a relic of those old Western Civ days when colleges felt absolutely no compunction about framing world history as a lesson in why Europe and the U.S. came to dominate the world. But that's not the point, at least not the point I'm trying to make right now. The point is that Stern had this crazy idea that he could, one, teach freshmen how to write, and two, that he could do so while having them engage with really big problems in the really distant past. And he certainly did teach us to write essay after essay, each one painstakingly banged down on my dad's old Smith Corona and submitted with equal amounts of hope and whiteout, only to be sent back mortally wounded, hemorrhaging, and I hesitate to say literally hemorrhaging, I should say figuratively hemorrhaging. Please note that, anybody who's taking my class with red ink. I worked so hard for that B plus he gave me at the end of the first quarter. Imagine how I felt when I got an A at the end of the second. Yes, except we didn't do that back then. <laughs> and Stern certainly did have us engaged with really big questions in the really distant past. Who knew that this approach would actually come to define me as a scholar 40 years later? To wit, that perennial struggle between the Socratic tradition and the Abrahamic one. Now, Stern was concerned basically with Jews and Christians dealing with the Greco-Roman legacy. I'm interested in how Jews, Christians, and Muslims dealt with it and interacted with one another. But be that as it may be, my perennial fascination with really big problems in the really distant past and my firm conviction that that matters has Stern written all over it. So there you have it. Those are two courses I took as a freshman, only one of which I chose and how they changed my life. So what lessons have I learned that might be of use to you as you're entering your first year of college? Well, here are five for your consideration. Lesson one, I learned that the world of knowledge is a lot bigger than I could possibly have imagined based on what I had access to in high school. Did I really want to be the intellectual equivalent of that ugly American tourist ordering hamburgers in every restaurant in Europe? No. 
given what was being laid out before me, how could I not step outside of my comfort zone and try something new? Lesson two. I learned that so much of what it meant to be successful in high school, and therefore in the admissions process, was tied to success in math and science, two subjects that are well represented and generally well taught in high school. How could I have known, based on my high school experience, that I was made for religious studies, or sociology, or art history, or whatever? Between you and me, it makes me wonder about the 46 math majors that graduated from here last spring, the single highest number of graduates in any major. How many of them became math majors simply because math was what they did so well in high school? At least the three Pomona students who graduated with a degree in religious studies last year will never be accused of succumbing to that kind of inertia. <laughs> I learned that my mind was drawn to those messy, unanswerable, yet compelling questions about culture and human, human condition. How could I have known that in high school? Neither my mind nor my high school was ready for that kind of subversion. I think of it as a Piaget stage. Such messy, unanswerable, yet compelling questions about culture and human condition are clearly best saved for the college years. Here you are. Lesson four, I learned that for me, writing an expository essay was a lot harder, a lot ch more challenging than solving math problems. More challenging and ipso facto more satisfying when I find it again a master. Sure, there's a good argument the universe is made up of numbers, right? But culture is made up of words, and if you truly learn how to use words in all their marvelous complexity, and I'm not just talking about English ones, by the way, take the time to master a foreign language for heaven's sake. You will get people's attention and all sorts of good things will follow regardless of your major. Lesson five, I learned that even though I was good at math and science, I had never been ignited by them. And you may not know it now, but your time here is all about ignition. Individual, intellectual ignition. That last one is probably the most important lesson to draw from this little narcissistic stroll down memory lane. <laughs> To distinguish between what you're good at and what you as a person, a card-carrying human being, need for the sake of living your life to the fullest in the short time, and it is short, that you have on this planet. If you forget everything else I've said, just remember your genus and your species, homo sapiens. Be wise, discerning, and thoughtful as you pick your classes these next four years and insist that the cumulative effect of your choices leave you even more wise, more discerning, and more thoughtful at the other end of this chapter in your lives. Congratulations, class of 2019. Now go forth and conquer. <laughs>